chapter 1, verse 27. The Bible says God created humanity in God's own image, in the divine image of God. He created them. Another translation says He created them to be like Himself. This is an unprecedented thing that God would take His image and put it on anything in His creation. But on day six, God chose to take His creation and to implant that and imprint that upon man. Now, when He did that, it caused some unprecedented uh, abilities to come forth in man that no other creature had. And let me just share a couple of those. There are probably 15 or 20, but some that come to mind are we have the ability to choose. We are the creatures who can choose. We can determine the direction of our life. We have choice. We have will. We have determination. We are not driven by natural forces. We are not uh, subject to instinct alone. We have a choice. And that choice is because of the image of God. We can choose that which we can choose to go right or we can choose to ruin our life. Whatever we do, we choose that. So it is the ability to choose. The second ability that comes with the image of God is the ability to connect or to commune with God. Of all of God's creation, we are the only ones that can actually have a relationship with God. We can commune with Him. The reason being is because God is spirit, so therefore the, His image has made us spirit. And because we are spirit, we can now connect and commune and have relationship with God the Father through His Son Jesus by the Holy Spirit. So we have the opportunity to have relationship and be one with God. And the third ability that comes through this image of God is the ability to worship. We have, we were created and designed not only to worship, but for worship. And as a result of that, there is a particular design in us that allows us to be worshipers. We were created to be worshipers. And one of the things is we have been, we have been created with a center. We have a center, we have a seat, we have a throne, we have a heart or a core, and whatever that center has something in it all the time. God created us with a center so that He could be the center of our life because God deserves to be the center. But other things can be the center of our life as well. We can have not only God at the center, but we can have other gods at the center. And whatever a man has at the center of his life, that is what he worships. And so I can uh, be in the house of the Lord and I can listen to Christian music, but ultimately whatever is at the center of my life is my God, and that's what I worship. So everyone has a center to us. Secondly, we are created to serve whatever is at the center. We do not rule over what's at the center of our life. We are created to serve that, and because that space and that place is created for God, naturally, because God in His rightful place in the center, we would then serve Him. So whatever is at the center of my life is what I am going to serve. And so if I am serving something, or if there's something in the center of my life that doesn't belong there, then that's what we call idolatry. Idolatry is sim simply anything that is in the center of my life that is usurping the place of God. And so whatever is in the center, I'm going to serve. And the third thing that we know about this unique design is God has created us in such a way is to where we will focus on that which is in the center. It becomes our priority. It has our attention. It becomes our focal point. Now, you can see this design clearly laid out in the first two commandments. The first commandment says what? that uh, we are to have no other gods before Him. Well, the implication is that we have a center, that we can have a God, and that we can also have other gods other than just that one God. And then in the second commandment, He says you're not to bow down or to any other image or you're not to serve any other, which is an implication that we can serve other things. We do serve whatever's at the center of our life and that we can serve other things other than God. Now, because worship is at the 
center of us, it is, it is replicated also in the pictures of heaven. Heaven is a place where worship is at the center. So worship is absolutely central. It is part of the image of God. Now, you must remember, the enemy hates the image of God. He tries to mar and and mark out the image of God wherever it is. The assault on our nation, the assault on our world, is partly an assault by darkness against the image of God. The, the devil hates the image of God. And so wherever he sees the image of God, then through the works of darkness, he tries to diminish that or to dilute the image of God to make it something lesser and lower so that it is then ineffective. Now, today what I'd like to do is I would like to give you uh, what I call some reality checks when it comes to worship. Uh, I think these are good. I think uh, that we ought to, uh, to take a look at these and that we ought to consider uh, what is actually happening. So let me give you the first reality check. The first reality check is this. The assumed image of collective worship in America does not represent the reality of the vast majority of the body of Christ in the earth. Now I'm going to give you a minute to look at that so that you can grasp exactly what we're saying. What we're saying is what you see here most Christians in the world do not have. They do not experience this. Their experience of worship is something much different than ours. Now, in this this is not the norm. Two weeks ago, we were just getting ready to worship. In fact, he was, uh, the, he, Timothy was already strumming, and I, I was up on my feet. I was just lifting my hands up to the Lord, and the music was beginning to play, and the Holy Spirit literally interrupted my worship. And he said to me, as best I can remember, he said, you know this is not the norm, right? Wow. Wow. Okay, it took me back. Because here are some things you ought to consider. Most church gatherings are held in secret in our world. They are underground. They move around. They move from location to location. If you want to go there, you have to know somebody who knows somebody because there are no signs. There are no indicators that there is a church there at all. In a lot of the world, all of the gatherings are held in secret. There are 44, this is according to the communist Chinese government, this is their own figure. In 2018, they acknowledged that there were 44 million Christians in China. But there are not buildings to hold 44 million people in groups of 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 or 10,000. These people are just clustered all over everywhere. They're moving around all the time. Secondly, church facilities are small with limited conveniences. Many people worship in facilities that are not designed for worship. They have minimal conveniences. If they have electricity, they're doing well. Having multimedia presentation. And by the way, when we talk about the American image of worship, what we're talking about is a stage with full instrumentation and orchestra and musicians and cutting edge worship leaders and world class songs and lots of multimedia and video and strobe lights and fog machines and all kinds of mood lighting. That is the American epitome of the image of worship. But that is not the understanding of most of the believers in the world. And it is good for us as Americans to understand that. That our norm is not the norm of the world. 383 million Christians in Asia. Where are they? They're all over everywhere. A few here, a few there, a few there. They're gathering and they're worshiping. And by the way, when these people are gathering, they know they can't make a lot of noise because they'll be found out. Most of these 
are meeting where there is limited instrumentation. Maybe something acoustic. Maybe some sort of percussion instrument. And that's all they have. They don't have facilities for electric this and electric that and digital soundboards and all kinds of microphones. They don't have it. Church meetings are not held in buildings at all. This is people's reality all over the world. There are people who meet in tents. I've had I've been to church in tents, under trees. This is people's reality. This is born-again believers' reality in a lot of the world. There are 600 million Christians in Africa. And where are they meeting? Because they are meeting. Because that is what we do as a body. We get together. We gather. We worship. Where are they? All of these people are just clustered everywhere. There, there, and it might move around. Right? Here is David's image of worship. David's image of worship is Psalm 47.1. Come on and clap your hands, everyone. Shout to God with the raucous sounds of joy. Do you know what is missing in all of that? All of the stuff that we categorize and claim as worship. You have hands, you have a heart, and you have a voice. And other than that, that seems to be outside David's full image of worship. David created a lot of instruments. David, um, he manufactured a lot of instruments. There are the scriptures that indicate that he came up with uh, a lot of creative instruments. But at the end of the day, the vast majority of the body of Christ worships God with their voice and with their hands whether they have an instrument or not. That is the reality in this world today. Now, I want to ask you a question. If that is the norm, because it is the norm, what we see is not the norm. If that is the norm, and God doesn't seem to have a problem with it, maybe it's not the goal either. Maybe we haven't arrived after all. Or maybe we haven't arrived at all. Reality check number one. Conclusion, most people worship God in this world with their voice and with their hands. And that's it. If they might have some instrument, they are privileged. So if you have an experience that is much greater than that or different than that, like we do here, then we should consider it a great privilege to have a facility where we meet that is fairly designed for worship, that is built for this, that accommodates worship. And, and if your experience is that I'm used to worship in a stained glass facility with a climate-controlled environment, and I'm used to having uh, lots of sa- sights and sounds and images and all of these things, that's okay. Just know that's not the norm. And it may not be the goal. Reality check number one. Reality check number two. There is a noticeable trending away from the Word of God as the foundation and the pattern of corporate worship. The image of worship in America has changed radically over the last 60 years. And there is a different image in much of worship. And the reason is, is because our worship has been trending with our culture. So what we're finding is, instead of the church impacting the culture, the culture is impacting the church. And how does that, what is the shift? How has culture shifted over the past 60 or so years? First, we are in an entertainment-based culture. There is no argument for that. We require a lot of stimulation. Our culture requires a lot of visual, oral, mental, and 
all different kinds of stimulation in order to keep our attention. Now, the way you can tell just how far we've come, and when I use that term, how far we've come, it's either how far up or how far down. Here's the way you can tell. Go on to YouTube and find a television commercial that was made around 1960. Watch that commercial and compare it to what you see today. The amount of stimulation is so much greater. The amount of changing, rapid, vivid images because the culture requires that to stay attentive. And so what we do is then we change our worship experience in order to keep people attentive. Because if we don't have all that, then people are going to say, we're not cool, we're not relevant, we're not real. Secondly, we have a self-based culture that is based in individualism that is a self-centered and self-expressive culture. So what we have seen in worship is a trending away from songs about the Word of God and based on the Word of God more to now personal experience and personal feelings. I'll move on. A concert-based culture. Hey, this is great. Think about this. This is mind-blowing. Do you know that probably 99.99% of the entire population of the world from the time of the Garden of Eden who has actually had a concert experience has been alive on the earth only in the last 60 years? A concert experience a concert-based culture is new. This is relatively new. Only in the past 60 or 70 years would somebody know what having a concert experience is. You talk to somebody in the 1500s, they're not going to understand that. In the 800s, they're not going to understand that. In the B.C. times, they're not going to understand that. But in the last 60 to 70 years, probably almost... 99.999% of all the people who've had a concert experience are here now or have been very recently. And when you have a concert experience, it means you have a stage, you have a show, you have a favorite band. Now listen, if you're going to pay good money to go to concert, you're going to go see your favorite band play your favorite songs. And you expect a performance. You expect special effects, you expect a show, you expect uh, a grand stage, you expect all these great things. But that concert-based culture now is in our thinking. And so now, worship over the years is slowly trending toward more performance than it is personal encounter with Jesus. Because that's what we do. We come and we watch a bunch of people on a stage play because that's how we're geared concert based culture and lastly a casual based culture where things are much more random much more free form uh, the way you can tell is just look at the poetry that is being produced in our culture over the last 50 or 60 years it's very much free form freestyle um, uh, it's it's random it's all over the show uh, there's no meter no rhyme uh, there's no cadence to it, uh, it's, and, and there's no sense to it, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and you, you just, you can't, make, and, you, and, and listen, you, you can't, you, not only can you not hardly understand it, but you can't memorize it because there's no cadence in it. There's no rhyming in it. There's no uh, memorable things that make the connections. So we have a very casual-based culture that is very free form, no boundaries, no rules, just whatever, we just throw it out there, and, and it's, it's very random. So, the conclusion is, then, that reality check number two, we have moved away from the Word of God as a foundation and as an identification in worship, more toward things that are us. Less Him, more us. I'm not looking for an amen. Because you know it's true. When you look 
at the songs that are being written, I would say to you today that most of the worship material that we use today or that is available to, to us today, not that we use it, but it's available, most of that will not be around in 10 years. And it certainly will not endure into eternity. And there are several reasons for that. One is because it lacks a fundamental foundation in the Word of God. And the second reason is because it is very difficult to sing it. Sometimes when people are, uh, are in this worship movement kind of thing, they forget that about 99% of the people that they are dealing with have no musical training whatsoever. And so when songs don't rhyme, and there's no meter to them, and there's no intuitiveness to them, it's very difficult for people to learn them, it's difficult for them to sing, and it's very difficult for them to memorize. In other words, they don't stay in your heart. And so you're not singing those things when you're somewhere else because they don't register with you because they're too difficult to grab hold of. So, here is Paul's image of worship. In Ephesians 5, verse 19, encourage each other with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. So, what is he? He gives four types of songs there. Now, before you think you know what they are, consider this. What are the psalms? That's just the Word of God. It's singing the Word of God. Can you remember when we used to sing the Word of God in church? Some of you are not old enough. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> we used to actually sing the Word. People would take psalms, and they would put music to them, and we would sing them. And, and believe it or not, that's what they're made for. <laughs> they're songs. Secondly, hymns. Now, when you think about the word hymn, if you think of a book inside a pew, uh, in the back of a pew, uh, in a denominational setting, that is not what that word means. That word means any song that has its basis in the Word of God, that may have direct re uh, connections or uh, di direct references to the Word of God. It is songs about God. It is songs about uh, that, that has some sort of a connection uh, to the Word of God. And then there are the spiritual songs, which are these impromptu new songs, or the songs of the Lord, as the Bible calls them, that arise when we gather in corporate worship. This is why corporate worship is so amazing, because then, then the song of the Lord begins to rise. It can rise anywhere, but oftentimes in our corporate worship it'll rise. This is a, a prophetic song of the Lord, and it is meant to, uh, for exhortation and edification and comfort, and it ministers to the body. Those are the spiritual songs. And then there is the music in the heart. And this is probably one of the greatest ones of all because the music in the heart is just my personal praise to Him. It's in the Sela times when I'm just lifting my voice and I'm magnifying Him and I'm praising Him. I'm not publishing this song. I'm not sharing this song with anybody else. It's not going on the overhead. It's just my, it's my praise, my personal expressions of praise to the Lord. That becomes the melody and the music in my heart before the Lord. So, when you consider this, the conclusion to reality check number two is, do we need any more than that? I'd say that about covers it. We sang a great hymn this morning. Anybody remember it? You say, we didn't sing a hymn, Pastor Ray. Yes, we did. You are way maker, miracle worker promise keeper, light in the darkness. Where does that come from? The Word. We're just singing the Word of God. Singing who He is. Reality check number two. We have moved away from the Word. Things are more complicated. Things are less simple and basic than what most of the world experiences reality check number three so here it is our worship now more about the songs have you ever noticed that it's all about the songs wow great song great song God's saying hey what about me it's about us self-based why because our culture is self-based it's more about stimulating sights and sounds because we are more entertainment based than we ever have been and it's more random because we are a casual-based 
culture. So here is reality check number three. You ready? Here we go. Worship is the best exercise for your heart. You want to get your heart in shape? Worship. Worship Him. It is divine cardio. This gets your heart going. You see, true worship is not in my mind. True worship is not in the environment. True worship begins in my heart. It's in my spirit. It is a spirit exercise. Now, I know what people think about exercise. People don't like to talk about exercise, but I want to tell you, worship is the best exercise for your heart. It causes your heart and your spirit to engage with God. You see, I'm not just clapping my hands. I'm not just lifting my hands. I'm not just bowing before the Lord. I'm actually engaging my spirit and my heart. I am entering in uh, to His gates. I'm entering into His courts. I'm entering into the holy place. I'm standing on holy ground. I'm standing in this holy of holies with Him. And I am doing it as a privilege because He has quickened me and it is my spirit that enters in. Now that's good news. Here's what Jesus said. John 4, 23. From now on, worshiping the Father will not be a matter of the right place, but of the right heart. Oh, wow. Look at that. Not about the place. It's about the heart. It all begins in the heart. This is right. So I can, I can come in. I can, I can watch some people play some songs. And I can clap my hands a little bit and sort of try to figure out the words or whatever. But worship is an engaging of my spirit with God, regardless of what else is going on. This is why we try as best we can to eliminate all other attraction, all other distraction, all other complication. Because when we come into it, this is why we don't have lights flashing around. We don't have continually changing uh, backgrounds behind the words. Why? Because we don't want to compete with the one we're worshiping. Why do we want to make it like a circus when the one we are worshiping is greater than any of that. It's not worth the distraction. This is why we tell people. When we, when, this is why we pay $1,700 every time we put the key in the front door in the church. We want a place where we can eliminate distractions. This is why we tell people, when we, when we worship, we don't want people walking around, grabbing coffee, Carrying on conversations. Why? Because we're worshiping. And the only thing that matters is Him in worship. Now notice what Jesus said. Your worship must engage your spirit. This is John 4, 23 again. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before Him in their worship. Those who worship Him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves. Now, this is so cool. Because worship is a spirit exercise, that means it doesn't matter what's happening in the rest of my life. It doesn't matter what's going on in my mind, which can be at a tremendous battleground. It doesn't matter what's happening with my attitudes. It doesn't matter what's happening in my body or my finances or my job or my family. When it's time to worship Him, it is a spirit exercise. And all it takes is me engaging my spirit. I have a choice to engage my spirit above all the other things. Those other things are not immaterial they are significant but they are secondary when it's time to worship him i engage my spirit with him my wife could have shooed me out on the way to church or here's another believable one i, I could have family issues But guess what? When it's time to worship, it's my spirit connecting with Him. Him alone. It doesn't make a difference whether somebody else is doing this or doing that or whatever. I'm connecting. I'm engaging my spirit with Him. 
I don't know whether all the words are spelled right. I just know I'm connecting with Jesus. So, what's at the center of your life right now? Because whatever it is, that's your God. And you're serving that. And it is your priority. So if you don't know what's at the center, start from the other end and work backwards. Where's my priority? What am I serving? That's my God. You know the great thing about Jesus? When He shows us something, He says to us, you know what? We can fix that. We can fix that. I brought something before the Lord and I was so upset about it and struggling with it. He says, relax. We can fix that. I got that sorted. Already dealt with that. We get it. Whatever is at the center, that's ultimately what I'm going to serve. Now, consider. Maybe there's some secondary thing that's been usurping your worship. Wow. Guess what? We can do something about that too. We can choose today to put it where it belongs, underneath the Spirit. Y'all pray for Alan. Don't you love it? We've been privileged, the only creatures in all of creation, to worship Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. Worship is the best exercise it engages my heart maybe as you're listening you're thinking you know it's been a while since I've been in a worship experience where I've really been engaging my heart where I've allowed my spirit to just connect with God so many things hanging on me working at me and against me coming at me, vying for my attention, vying for my strength, vying for all of these things. But today, I'm going to put those back where they belong. And I'm going to stand in the place of a true worshiper. Because those who worship must worship in spirit. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit showing us what is the very depths of our innermost being, what is working in us, what is happening in us. You know all and see all, and you restore all. You repair all, and you change all. And I thank you today. So worshiper, arise. Worshiper, arise. Stand on your holy ground. Let your spirit be released. Regardless of all the failures and flaws and faults and fretting and the threats of the enemy and all the rest of it, regardless of all of that, stand your ground and declare, I'm going to get my exercise because I'm going to be a true worshiper. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.